If you speak to a kid and you continually tell them you're no good enough and you're not going to be able to do anything, funnily enough, guess what? They won't be able to do it. And if we're able to take control and become responsible for ourselves, there's nothing more empowering than that. And in sport, if you don't have the belief and confidence, you're never going to be able to achieve anything. So I think with independence, I think can see huge benefits to the future generations of mm. sports people. In terms of the thing that you said about David Soul, um, you know, captain in the team, yeah. I think he was born down south as well. Yeah. And I don't see any issue with that because, you know, I did a, a, a referendum documentary with uh, John Beatty just before the Commonwealth Games. And that was one of the points he made that he said that, you know, when you were involved with the, the national setup, did you not always think that, uh, you know, these English people or guys that came and qualified for Scotland, yeah. oh, they didn't care about it so much? And no, not at all. Mm. Because once you cross that white line and you've got the Scotland jersey on, you're not like thinking, oh, I didn't give a toss. You're committed to the team. You're committed to the cause. You're, you want to win. There's professional pride. So this thing about, oh, you're not 100% Scottish, that doesn't, you know, doesn't count. That's rubbish as far as I'm concerned. You wonder too, though, in Scottish football, because we're, we're sharing a border with, with England. Mm -hmm. English football has, has just gone bonkers, <laughs> I mean, as far as I'm concerned. It's interesting that they have all these fantastic foreign players. And uh, you know, for their scale and history, a pretty moderate in, you know, national, national team. But if you're uh, in Scottish football looking at England, I mean, you're bound to feel that you're too small and too poor, are you not? Well, th but again, that's where something that I think that we need to become, you know, confident within ourselves. Once you become confident within yourself, you can look outward and actually embrace things. But at the current stage, yeah, I mean, you look down south and it's like a wash with money. And you think, well, Chris, how can we handle it? But yeah. you've got to have that belief within yourself. You know, it's not even in sport. I mean, across all walks of life, if you don't believe in yourself, you won't get very far. And, um, you know, the, the, the English Premier League now is, is a global league. It's not a traditional English league like it was 20, 30 years ago. The English Championship is more of a, a league like that where there's a, a more of a, a spread of British and Irish players. Um, but, uh, and I think there's a direct correlation between the, the enhancement of uh, the, the Premier League as a global league and you look at the, the, you know, the next generation of the English national team and it is nowhere near as good as the previous one and you know, the previous one before that. And I think that they've got serious issues in terms of how they're going to actually rectify that because it's, um, you know, they've, the, they've, they've gone down the route of uh, globalisation of, the, of the, the, the national league. How is that impacting on the national team? And it's, you, quite clearly, there's a, there's a direct connection. You mentioned earlier about Norway, I think, as well. Yeah. We complain about the money coming into the, you know, not not enough money to yeah. give it critical mass, etc. In Scotland, but in Norway, you're saying they're doing better than us. Well, the the, the, the point, obviously, that uh, the, the English Premier League is so awash with money is because of the television money, you know, which is actually subsidised by us as well. You know, we pay into that Sky subscriptions, BT, BBC. You know, we pay into the pot. And then we get a disproportionate, disproportionate uh, amount back into the Scottish game because the English game is attractive. That's where they put most of the money. So we're actually subsidising that from Scotland. Whereas Norway, an independent country, their latest television deal, I think, is 180 million. Scotland's, I, th I think, roughly, you're talking about 80 million. So there's a huge difference there where in Norway, they get to see all the, you know, the games down south and Scottish games as well. They see all those games as well. But as an independent nation, mm -hmm. they're actually funding and putting money into their own game, and subsequently they'll have you know a higher standard, f you know down the further down you don't the line. I think of them as a great footballing nation. I don't, I don't mean to be unkind. No. I think they did once beat Brazil, which is more than we've ever done. But Aye. you know they're not you know a world power of football. No, they're not. But this is the whole point that the uh, when you, you you take it out of the the football context and you look across you know all walks of life in Norway, the infrastructure that they've got is so far ahead of what we have here. And it's about, you know, Scotland, in Scotland, we need to move to the, the, the stage of understanding that we need to manufacture things and, and in all different industries, and football's no different. We need to manufacture and make the youngsters, you know, produce the new youngsters, you know, build them up and sell them on. 
and then you need to continue that to sustain it. You need to keep producing and keep producing. There's nothing genetically different about Scotland in terms of, oh, we produced players 30 years ago and we can't produce them now. There's nothing changed genetically. It's the world's changed. You know, you've got all these other uh, things that kids are interested in. When I was growing up, I went out and I played football every night with my friends and my family. It was every night. And the, there's, there's a... Um, Matthew Said, who uh, used to play yeah, table tennis, the he's, yeah, mm -hmm. and he writes with the Times. I think it was him that uh, came up with this, or there was a study had written that to be a, a, an elite sports person, 10,000 hours, you need to put 10,000 hours into whatever you're doing. And you're putting those hours in when you're you know, a youngster and you're running about, whereas now, obviously, it needs to be more structured and coached because kids have got all these other things that take their attention. Yeah, I think it's, even in New Zealand, you know, it's at home, at home, rugby and all yep. that. I mean, they, they, they have that same battle. It's, it's trying to get the young lads out onto the pitch, Aye. even there. Um, well, you're very passionate uh, about this, about the, the referendum. Have you heard anything from, from No, which has kind of made you think, whoa, didn't think about that one before, that's just made me reassess a bit. Is there something in their message that, that has caught your attention? I'd love to say, yeah, there was, but honestly, no. I mean, like everything else, I think like every, you know, uh, member of the public in Scotland, you know, when No throw a new uh, uh, story that sort of scares you a bit, you go, oh, oh. And then within about five minutes, once you research it, you realise that there's actually no foundation to it. Mm -hmm. And that's what really pisses me off, to be perfectly honest, that, you know, not everybody has the time or the interest to actually, you know, analyse these things in depth. And that's where a lot of the public becomes scared because they hear yes, you know, refuting it. And they hear no saying, well, no, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, that is the, the nature of something when it, you know, you've got two people arguing complete polar opposites that you're going to get two opposing views. But a lot of it is also being floated out through the mainstream media. I mean, that's the, the, there is, I think, I think one of the big issues is that, that you know, BT, Better Together, do seem to have an, an access and an ability, if you like, uh, to use the mainstream media, which the majority of people still get, in order to feed those stories out. And you're right, by the time sometimes they're kind of undermined, you know, another voice comes in, as we heard one on, on NATO uh, th this week, you know, the woman who was our uh, ambassador says, no, there'd be no problem with NATO membership. But that seed is then planted, you know, that, that you wouldn't get into the organisation. This is exactly what it is, it's the people against the establishment. You know, the, there's a huge groundswell of uh, opinion and feeling that we want to take control of our own affairs. And I think it's, I mean, listen, Things change all the time. I mean, if you go back a hundred years, you know, the financial markets weren't the way they are now. You know, it's, everything changes, they evolve. If people want something to happen, it will happen. Things that were, you know, we take for granted now weren't invented a hundred years ago. Things change all the time, but the fundamental principle and the nature of this in terms of self-determination, that never changes throughout the years. It's a case of there's nobody better place to run our affairs than the, you know, the people here in Scotland. That cannot and will never change. And, you know, it was interesting, um, you know, talking about the media and stuff like that, <clears throat> sometimes to take a, a, um, a look at things from, from outside and how they, uh, how they see it. And mm -hmm. there was a bit in the Malta Times that I read about how they had spoken about it. they're coming up for 50 years independent. And it was the exact same scare stories they had about how they're saying that what would happen with our currency? How could we handle pensions? We're only a small island. How can we look after ourselves? And they were basically saying that every one of them, just an imaginary obstacle. And the argument of nobody's better place to run Malta than the people in Malta has been shown to be true. And they're now, they're now independent members of the European Union and they're, aye, they're who, tiny. Aye, who have almost the same number of uh, representatives of Scotland. And I think that, you know, that once, you know, this is the big thing for me that, like, you know, you asked the question about is there anything no says that, you know, makes me go, oh, that's made me change my opinion or well, that's got me thinking. And there isn't because you just, all you need to do is sit down and the thing that I, I've always had a suspicious, you know, mind or whatever, and I like to add logic to things. And you add logic to the arguments and the no argument does not stand up. I mean, even just, for example, the thing about, like, um, the potential of defaulting on debt. Well, we can't default on debt because it's not legally ours, right? So we go through that whole sort of, you know, back and forth, the same argument that goes through all the time. And then they say the, the markets would, uh, would punish kill us, government. punish us and stuff like that. And you say to yourself, how in God's green earth, when you add logic to that argument, can that stand up? Because what they're basically saying is that Scotland, who effectively has almost no deficit because the vast majority of it is made up with interest payment on the debt, no... Uh, 
uh, sorry, uh, so no debt, no deficit, a huge potential of you know renewable energies. We've got the, the biggest uh, oil reserves in the EU. That the markets, all they're interested in is making money. They're going to look at that and say, "Oh no, that's a basket case. I'm not investing in that." That doesn't make sense. I think what they're actually saying is not it's a basket case, but despite the fact that it's not a basket case, we're going to make a political judgment, a moral judgment on aye. them to punish them. Aye, and the, so mar we, and the markets we'll forego, don't do that. We'll forgo the profits that we would have made yeah. in order to harm Scotland. And the, mar and the markets don't do that. <laughs> All they're interested in is making money. And clearly Scotland is a... And, and by the way, you can relate that to a lot of other things in terms of all this nonsense about companies pulling out and all that sort of stuff. Why on earth is a company going to pull out of an area where it's profitable, making money, just for, for what? I mean, for what reason? Of course a company, you hear a lot of big companies talking about they don't want things to change. It was exactly the same in 79 and 97, and all these things are exactly the same. Companies don't want these big things to change because they're fearful of things changing. But the point is, pragmatism takes over. If there's a yes vote, all these companies are not going to move elsewhere. They're going to demand that the UK government and the Scotland government get round the table and negotiate and get things sorted out. Pragmatism takes over and quite clearly as we can see, the United Kingdom, Westminster government, they are run by big businesses. They're in bed with these big businesses. You think the big businesses are going to turn around and say, uh, right, okay, you just do what you want and we'll have to spend billions relocating, spending more money on well, staff. the currency is the other one. Of course. And it costs them money, a lot of money. Of course it is. Not, any logical person can understand that a currency union is in the interest of, of, of both parties. I mean, Alistair Darling said it before, like last year, before the actual campaign started off, he said it himself. All of a sudden, it gets tight, the polls, things change, and they put forward this complete bluff that obviously, you know, the two Nobel laureate economists come out and say as well. Yeah. It's a total bluff. Even Muscatelli, who was on the yeah, Kalman Commission, the university, he yeah, came out and said an economic vandalism to say that there would not be... So it's the biggest case of cutting your nose off to spite your face. Well, the markets are jumping. I mean, it's the Financial yes. Times is saying, I mean, they're having to try and quell the yes. panic in the markets as it gets closer and the, because of the currency issue. Of course, and the pound's suffering because of that. So this nonsense about how oh, an independent Scotland would be, you know, you would be really wanting a currency and the rest of the United Kingdom are quite happy and fine. That's total rubbish. Is... Um, is this not just winnable, but do you think it will be won? I mean, have you got, I mean, we shouldn't get ahead. It's like predicting a match <laughs> in advance. Whenever you think you're going to win a game, I mean, guess what happens? But, you know, what is your instinct about it now? I think we'll win. I definitely think we'll win. You know, and, and you know, <laughs> using the, the football parlance as well, you know, momentum is a massive thing. You know, when things start to get tight and the momentum and the belief is behind one side, it's amazing what you can, what you can achieve. And I think that, um, you know, clearly things are, are, are tight and the momentum is, is with yes. And you get to a stage where there's a tipping point as well, where there's a lot of soft no voters who would want to vote yes, but they're almost just a bit you know, scared. And once it gets closer to the actual day and people actually get more involved and find out more of the facts, those soft no's will you know, veer over to, to yes yeah. as well. Yeah, so I think also there's that what part of that is that people see other people voting yes. yes. And they kind of, people don't like to be on the losing side. Of and then course. they start to think, what if it's yes and I voted no? No, I want to be part of it. Yeah, definitely. That's what I'm saying. Once you get to that tipping yeah. point, yeah. that there's a cute, then there's a groundswell, obviously, of uh, of people exactly like you just explained there, where they, they, you know, all of a sudden they start seeing people that they thought were no as well. And the more people openly talk about it as well and say, I'm voting yes, by the way. And exactly like you just said, where people then think, oh, great. Oh, I didn't want to be on that side then. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, it sounds stupid and yeah. ridiculous that... Human nature. We're, yeah, exactly. And we've argued for two years about the economics and this and that and, and everything, but it can almost come down to, you know, just human nature of, as you explained there.